today we are gathered at uh, Pindar Dalai, writer Pindar Dalai's home. This is his office and you, as you can see it's uh, well populated with books and his library. And uh, I have asked him to talk about how uh, he became the writer he is and what led him to this point. Right. So Pindarji, would you start at the beginning? I mean, I would prefer you go back as far as you can to your earliest memories mm -hmm. and tell me something about that. Well, my earliest memory is um, actually holding my mother's hand in Leamington Spa and it was in the Midlands in England. I must have been probably only five years old. And basically, it is basically us walking down the street to the store. And the reason why I remember it is because she used to use a hand lotion that was very fragrant and floral. And so that kind of smell stayed with me throughout my life. And um, it's, a, it's a fond memory and it's a wonderful memory of my mother when she was young. And then what else? Um, were there any books at that time? Do you remember, what about your education? When does it begin and where does it begin? Well, I, uh, I went to middle school in England and then we moved to Canada in 1979. And in 1979, I went to junior school and then uh, went to high school in Pitt Meadows. And in Pitt Meadows, um, I graduated in 1985 from Pitt Meadows Secondary School. And, and then afterwards, I went to Douglas College for two years. And then I went to SFU where I um, studied English literature and I did a Bachelor of Arts uh, in English literature. And so that was my educational journey. My first time that I actually discovered poetry, though, was in grade 11. Huh. And in grade 11, uh, we read J. Alfred Prufrock, T.S. Eliot's yeah. J. Alfred Prufrock. And it was one of those poems that just kind of spoke to me and it just hit me with a, uh, a kind of a love of language, a love of imagery, mm. uh, his, his whole approach to actually creating imagery, um, his modernist uh, kind of writing techniques. Mm. And at that time, it stayed with me. I wasn't a poet, but it stayed with me. Mm -hmm. And so it stayed with me throughout um, my high school, uh, last couple of years of high school. And it stayed with me when it, uh, when it was uh, time to go to Douglas College. I took a lot of English courses there too. Okay. And I got introduced to so many different writers. Um, people like um, uh, Sam Rushdie, uh, people like um, T.S. Eliot, Ezra mm. Pound, mm. Uh, William Carlos Williams. Mm. All of the modernist poets, and uh, and so I was really inspired by that. Mm. Um, I also was really kind of aware of um, a lot of issues around race mm. and the migrant experience. So this is very early. Yeah, so very early. You're still in uh, school, is it? Still in, yeah. in in college. In college. Yeah. I did not have a language to talk about racism mm. or. Uh, the migrant experience because I was still learning, but I certainly experienced all of those things. Mm -hmm. And so the one way to kind of find a way to express myself was through the writing process. And at that time, even though I was studying a lot, I wrote a lot of bad poetry. <laughs> like everyone else. Yes. Um, so it was, um, it was a time that uh, it was very kind of foundational for me, um, mm. practicing writing, mm. writing around subjects that were around alienation, uh, teenage angst, mm. uh, racism. Was, was the language of Punjabi ever on your horizon at that time or not yet? Uh, it was, uh, Punjabi was like, you know, Kartavich uh, Boldasi. Okay. But Jadme Stradi Kardasi, it was all English. Ah. So, so your parents spoke Punjabi. My, my Punjabi parents, Boldi Sanji. Hanji. Hanji. Ah, okay. Yeah. But I'm Miri Punjabi fluent, ne? A Thorji broken one. Lickin Padlan view? Huh? Pardon? Pardon? No, my pardon me, okay. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, um, uh, Punjabi was a background to me. It was definitely part of my life. 
and part of yeah. uh, who I am and my so identity. So, uh, is it also Punjab that looms in the background, or does it ever come into your consciousness, Punjab province itself or the homeland? Yeah, I, I don't think it, it does. It doesn't because I was born in England, mm. and so this whole o a notion of experiencing home has been actually a very complex relationship. And so the the idea of home and identity mm. is complex and it um, it doesn't um, it doesn't harken back to my parents' sense of home in yeah. Punjab. Yeah. It really is a, a, a fragmented view of home of partially England, uh, partially Canada, yeah. and the whole notion of like maybe there is no sense of home if you don't actually kind of are not rooted yeah so um so i think uh, that's that's part of what i talk about in in terms of my um uh, writing itself is but then so you you were talking about uh, how publication of your books came about yes and i'm very interested in that atmosphere how you managed to get your books published right so um as I said uh, earlier, in 1992, there was this major conference called the Appropriate Voice Conference that took place. And in that conference, we talked about, um, and it was sponsored by the Writers' Union of Canada. So they were doing good progressive work at that time. And um, So you were telling me about publication issues. Um, at that time, it must have been difficult to get published. Was, How did you go about getting this done? I, I think, um, well, with that conference, there was a lot of publicity. Which conference? The was Appropriate Voice Conference that was okay. sponsored by the Writers' Union of Canada. Okay. That was in 1992. Which so, Ajmer Rode was leading? He, he was the, he was the co-chair of the committee. And so um, uh, Ajmer Rode um, was co-chair and was a senior member of the Writers' Union of Canada. And so um, we had a, a gathering of writers in um, Aurelia in Ontario mm. and we talked about these things and there was a lot of uh, controversy around the conference because uh, a lot of the publishing industry and newspapers were saying how come you're having a conference and you're not inviting white writers ha -ha. and so um, there was a lot of uh, editorial pickup on the conference and we um, the committee stood its ground and said this is a conference for marginalized people and that we're going to be actually continuing this conference, um, whether we get support of it or not. So uh, it was it was good. Um, we talked about publishing and the lack of opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think what it did do is with that editorial and also with the 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 spark of the conversation, many publishers um, started thinking about how do we expand the publishing program to include writers of color, to include marginalized writers, to include indigenous authors, to include women of color. Um, all of those demographics were sorely lacking in all of the publishing programs for the publishers. And so um, what happened next was I, I took my manuscript and I sent it to Arsenal Pulp Press, which was my first publisher, and um, and so they were they had they had become very interested in the conversation. So was there an individual, or was it the organization itself turning towards this? I I I am um, sent it to the publisher uh, Brian. Uh, uh, oh, I forgot his name now. That's okay. Um, uh, but Brian was Brian was the publisher, and he still is. Mm -hmm. And basically, he looked at the manuscript, and he said, "Yes, we'd love to publish it." And that was that was amazing. I mean, yeah. that was a phenomenal experience. Uh, he was also my editor, mm. and so we worked through the manuscript. And in 1995, it came out uh, as Ragas from the Periphery, and it was a, a really important moment for me because I had um, achieved one of the goals that I wanted to achieve which is to actually find a publication uh, uh, and make it real. And so that was good. Um, we had a wonderful launch at UBC. Ujjal Dasanj came out as the Minister of Multiculturalism. <laughs> so that was funny and it was good. And we sold lots of books. 
um, and uh, and it kind of began from there. Hmm. The um, the second manuscript I wrote was, as I said, it's a memoir of poetry uh, about Basmati Brown. Hmm. And with this one, um, during this time, there was expanding interest mm. in writers of color. Mm. So from 1995 to about 2000, mm. more publishers were actually taking on more writers of color. Mm. And so I sent my second manuscript to Harbor Publishing. Mm. And Harbor Publishing had just begun its new imprint, Nightwood Editions, mm. and so they accepted it mm. and they published it in, in 2000. And so that was uh, really quite a wonderful experience because it was a culmination of me traveling back to India, thinking about identity, thinking about cultural roots, mm. thinking about my mother and my father and my mm. siblings mm. and the experience of their life in Canada. So it was really gratifying and validating to have that take place um, for your family. And so that was, um, that was in 2000. And I took a long break. Um, I usually tend to take long breaks between books, um, uh, and so in in around 2010 to 2012, um, I started uh, be beginning, uh, not beginning, but uh, formulating another manuscript. And part of that manuscript, um, part of the, at least the access to publishing, was the fact that it was coming up to the centenary of the Kamagata Maru in 2014. And I wanted to write a series of poems around the Kamagata Maru. And it was a, a, a real um, step away from what I had done before. Um, I did a lot of research on the Kamagata Maru. I thought about how could I actually write new poems that were different from the poems that came before. Uh, but would kind of speak to the the the, um, the ship and to kind of explore the ship. So you're personifying the ship. I, I personify <coughs> the ship. Um, so I use anthropomorphosis the as um, <coughs> as a as a way of kind of speaking to the ship yeah. and giving the ship a personality. And so in that context, the one thing that I discovered was that the Kamagata Maru had a whole history of migration. Uh, shipping uh, people from Europe to Ellis Island in New York City uh, for a good 15 years mm. before the Kamagata Maru happened. Mm. And that really sat with me. I think that was uh, new information mm -hmm. that many of us did not really think about. Mm. And so I wanted to bring those two kind of events together and, and um, create, create a kind of tension. A, sy a synergy? Uh, attention, yeah, attention. attention between the fact that these migrants from Europe were accepted mm. and then the migrants from Punjab were not. And so it was like um, almost muddying the, this narrative um, so that whenever we thought, or whenever you read a poem about the Europeans, you'd immediately think about the migrants yeah. on the Kamagata Maru. Yeah. The other thing that was really going on at that time was the massive amount of uh, refugee uh, migration that was taking place from Syria and from African countries um, up to uh, both Early Turkey. 90s. No, that was in uh, 20, 2013, okay. 2012. Okay, oh, so fairly recent. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I really wanted to, I know I could not write a story about that, that's their story, mm. but I wanted to kind of write a parallel story. Mm. And so that's why I kind of uh, wrote Dream Arteries. And so Dream Arteries became the next poetry project and book. Mm. Um, at this point, I had kind of gone to one publisher um, and they were interested in publishing it. But then I talked to a friend of mine, uh, Jeff Dirksen, who's a professor up at SFU, and uh, he was on the poetry board for Talon Books. Okay. And they were interested in seeing what the manuscript was about. Okay. And so um, I sent them the manuscript, or Jeff sent them the, the manuscript, and um, the rest is kind of history. You know, they published uh, the book. Um, it went through first edition. It's now in its second edition. Wow! Congratulations. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, it's taught in universities. It's really interesting to see. I've done quite a few talks because um, I do a lot of the research presentation 
as part of the book. Mm. And so um, I've been to UBC, SFU, I've been to University of Fraser Valley, I've been back east to University of Toronto. Mm. I taught the book in, I went to New York twice and I read the, those poems uh, about the Ellis Island mm. and that was really quite amazing. And I also did some readings uh, in LA and in Austin and in Texas, mm -hmm. places like that. And so it was it was actually a marked difference between the publishing of these two books mm -hmm. and this book, because this book catapulted the whole narrative mm -hmm. of the Kamagata Maru, because it was a centennial, but yeah. also afterwards yeah. there was so much interest yeah. in the full narrative of both the Kamagata Maru yeah. and the European migration. Yeah. And so that's kind of like the journey that I've been on in publishing um, and gaining kind of um, a publishing record. You're going to read something for us? What are you going to read? Well, I'm going to read 10 Anonymous Journeys. And 10 Anonymous Journeys refers to the um, number of um, journeys that um, that the ship took f to Ellis Island. So it's, um, it's based on that and I will read the poem. Ten Anonymous Journeys. Coal clouds and gulls hang steady in the wind. Songs, scuffles, shuffles, screams, receipts, paper ways of mean. Dream arteries surge seaward, pistons beat, Engine screech and a cacophonous wind thunders. Mm. Barnacled black hulls slice and sluice out through the streaming shelter and from Antwerp. The port delivers the coal and cargo. Erosions ripple over memory, slip the border, lost in the rip of tide. They feed the loss. My body brims and bleeds into the thick air against the Atlantic. Sisters, brothers, cousins, and great ancestors passing quiet. Masters Schmidt and Thiele's eye the violence in the waters. The flap clap wind shifts a pattern, the deep distance, the long droning notes of my lungs. We curl into the confluence of the Labrador, breaking through contrarian waves. My hulled hands crash against the tide. To the unloved I will offer a part of me. In my hope, wards will be made complete for another life while my indentured life escapes me. Admire me then, do so when this beauty subsides, when my name ages, do so when I transmute and shift my name and become the SS Kamagata Maru. Wow. So that's, that's ten monasteries. So, so powerful, so powerful. Um, would you read something else, and uh, any other poem uh, from sure. this? Or? Um, <clears throat> I'll read this, the, just this short story. It's, a, it's called The Ship Story and basically it was my research into how the ship was built and it's beginning as a, a migrant ship. A Ship Story I was born in the yards of Scotstoun shipyard, launched into the Clyde River and given a German name. The straight funnel of my body threaded skyward by taut cables webbing heaven bound, my body a glory of black steel. I moved at the fastest pace then. I am old now, and my sojourn near the end. For this voyage, my new master purchased a second life for me. The old world had exhausted me. I already made more than 92 crossings between two worlds. In the new world, my usefulness was extinguished. Tomorrow, I will become part of the sun, feeding the salt water, the debris of my body. Each part of me I will offer to the unloved in hope my wards will be made complete, whole for another life, while my life escapes me. If you were to admire me then, do so when I was beautiful and strong. Do so when my name was young. Do so even now as I return the unloved, delivering them to the rifles, the latis, and the jails of Britain's Bharat. That's a ship story. So, Pinder, um we, we were having a discussion about what you're reading nowadays. Yeah. What's inspiring you? What's keeping you up at night? Well, there's a couple of books like um, Cecily Nichols and Harrowings was uh, an excellent read. And she's such an amazing master craftsperson in poetry. Hmm. And so I really enjoyed reading her book. 
And the book itself actually explores the black Canadian experience and the experience of um, farming. Uh, when the um, when the African American slaves uh, were f uh, were freedom, they gained their freedom. They came to Canada and they became farmers. And so she explores all of this in her book and her relationship to land. And so that's really interesting. She used a lot of research material again, um, and she she absorbed a lot of information that kind of captured those nuances. So you said you wanted to read some more poems from this book? Yeah, just book. a couple of more poems. Yeah. Um, these poems, like uh, after the Kamagata Maru section, uh, I wanted to connect one trauma to the next trauma. And the next trauma for me was the shootings of the Wisconsin temples in the U.S., in the, uh, the shooting in the Gurdwara in Wisconsin. So I'll just read uh, a couple of poems and then... Uh, yeah, we can have a conversation. Wisconsin Temple Poems. Temple the Prayer. The sun tips the high top of surreal. Page the turner. Book revelates. Heart spreads outward. The mind semi-automatic. Like a nine millimeter cycle. The caved out soul empty as sockets. Arm to hand, hand to arm. Eleven spoken for nine. Six ways to bless the chosen ones, and the sun runs high into the day. You are constant in each and every heart and in all things. Some give, some beg. This your wondrous play. You are the one who walks beside you. Okay. So that was a Good. Wisconsin poem. Um, the next poem in the series is called A Found Profile Reprofiled. A found profile reprofiled. Mm. Veterans Day baby, 40, an arm 911. Armed force psych up on uh, 1992. Patterns of misconduct, honorable discharge, criminal misdemeanors, DUI and mischief. Base playing to belong to something, anything. Practice the target. Other, the regalia of the input image here. So that's okay. my profile. And that's based on the profile of the assassin. Oh. And I wanted oh. to kind of make a, a statement about that. Okay. So this next poem is actually based on the FBI news release um, that was uh, generated um, that identified that there was no conspiracy to kill these people, that it was a one-off person who did it. And so it's called Investigative Erasure. 200, 300, 200, 40, 6, acted alone, not assisted, investigative leads, interviews, more than pieces of evidence, the results of the expansive investigation, no evidence was uncovered, no evidence to suggest ongoing threat to the Sikh community. So that's uh, based on the news release. And what I did was I created, um, there's a subgenre in poetry called the erasure poetry. And so um, I used that kind of technique to kind of create a poem out of a news release. Redaction. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, uh, so that's the investigative erasure poem. Uh, could you hold hold the page up, so I can see if there are sure. redactions? Okay, yeah. That's how I did. It. Okay. Okay, I think I'll stop there. So uh, my question to you was: uh, Do you have a poem you are fond of in which you seem to have captured what you set out to something uh, that was the essence of the experience, mm -hmm. and you feel very strongly about it? Yeah, I, I think that this one poem, From Sea to Sun, uh, it was based on my research uh, on the Sun Sea MV ship that brought the Sri Lankans to Vancouver. Yeah. And it's a raw poem, and its uh, you'll have to forgive me, it is hard to read um, because it is raw and because there's uh, imagery in there that really kind of, kind of hits me deeply. Mm -hmm. From Sea to Sun. 
quote, will detain the arrivals of uncertain identity. It is likely that this will not be sustainable as experience shows that most Sri Lankans are able to establish their identity in a timely manner, unquote. Scuppers bleed rust water in the specific. A red clad body hulls sideways, breaking a fall onto the tap deck. Her jeans scuff marked, the water of human cargo dribbles. Lower decks teem with humid enclosure, bilge brown rivulets roaming to the sun and sea. On the waterline, the salt kiss never ends. Quote, Let's play another game today, Gamini. I want you to imagine the deck is your home and that your cousins Adi and Veena are with you and you, are, you have decided to play the word game. Remember to explain the word clearly and make sure Adi and Veena explain theirs too. Yes, I know. You played this one last week. We will reach there soon. I, I will bring you many games. It is a flexible approach, this rough and tough. It allows for collaboration, agency cooperation. A flexible triage is today's way. Let's make sure we don't co-opt each other. Quarantine plans. Check. Medical checks. Check. Masks. Check. Identification and interview questions. Check. Detention and site security. Check. Individual case management procedures. Check. Executive oversight and execution. Check. Implementation execution. Check. We begin. Let's play another game, Gamini. Your favorite, the filmy game. You play a young child and medical patient with no nutrients left. I will play the mother who bled dry of everything. You will wear the mask and carry your ruined birth certificate. I will play what we saw when we left home. You will play the wounds Adi and Veena carried. This time both of us will play two actors playing innocents fleeing the crime scene. Tomorrow, we play mourners of your cousins and their parents who were my siblings. Today, we play soldiers together looking for home. Mama, who are they in the navy blue shirts and pants? Our saviors. Mama, who are we? Gamini, today we are refugees. Very, very powerful. Thank you. That's a tough poem. Thank you. It's a tough poem. How did this poem come about? Was what was the stimulus? I mean, was there a moment when I, I think I think thought, basically um, watching the news stories, the, the cycle, the ship, yeah, and the news cycle of the ship arriving, the Sri Lankans being detained, being treated badly, being treated like criminals, um, being quarantined. And then slowly having them go through a procedure of being rejected um, and being sent to Sri Lanka. And that was right when the massive upheaval and civil war was taking place. Mm. And so, so many people were just trying to get out of Sri Lanka just to find safe haven and, a, and sanctuary. So that really hit me hard is, is when a person is suffering so much and they try to find a way to get out hmm. and they have so many obstacles against them. And like we as migrants, like we, we left many, many difficult circumstances hmm. too. Hmm. Um, if we had had good lives in, in Bharat, then we would have stayed there. Or if uh, we had good lives anywhere else, we would have stayed there. But we were trying to make life better for ourselves. And that's just one part of it. But when you have a refugee, and when you have a person who is living in refugee camps, and who is living in the midst of such pain, such horror, I couldn't help but think about what I wanted to write about, and how I would capture that horror and that pain. So you've approached it obliquely. Mm -hmm. rather than confronting it right up front right. by uh, channeling it into various art forms, yeah. uh, reportage and then drama and actors and all that. Right. 
because the 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 crux of the matter is so powerful. Yeah, and and there's a there's a distance that I think a writer needs to take, even though that it's emotionally a time bomb mm. inside of yourself, and it's and it's emotionally raw. There is a distance that I think that the writer needs to rely upon in order to write about horror and pain, <laughs> and and by writing obliquely, you're able to use um, techniques craft um, to create a poem that hopefully um, captures that pain without actually describing in great detail the elements of that pain and horror and trauma. Mm. And I think that's the same with all of the poems that I've written, is there's a distance. And it's so funny because I think that distance is again my fragmentation from this notions of home and identity. And, and dislocation. Dislocation comes from it. And so I think that that's, that's, that separateness or that distance allows me to actually frame um, the poem in a way that allows for a lot more creative process to take place rather than a, a, a verbatim description. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. So um, may I ask which direction you're headed with your writing in the future and the way you're mind is taking you to that. Yeah, I've actually come full circle because I've come back to um, thinking about my punjabi -ness. And I've come to the place where I, I write uh, very simple poems about observations living in Surrey and, and thinking about all of the kind of experience of Punjabis in Surrey, the difficulties, the, the, good, the good experience. And I think I haven't really formalized a manuscript out of this. It's very much in its embryonic stage, but I'm thinking that I've come full circle and I see myself now in Surrey writing about Punjabi life here. Mm -hmm. And so where that takes me, I'm not sure, but um, it's certainly an interesting place to kind of begin yeah. it again. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So you, your parents, they, they have passed away, if you may ask? My father passed away in 2016, and my mother's still alive. Mm -hmm. She lives about 10 minutes away from my house. And you visit her often? I visit her and, and uh, mm -hmm. make sure that she's okay. She's about 75 years old and she's still got lots of energy and it's great. Um, she's happy. She has her little dog named Skippy that she loves and uh, she has a quiet life, which is really important after so many years of difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. Did she emigrate from uh, India to England? Yeah, what happened was, and this is... Um, this is so much connected to ships again, because my father and my grandfather um, left uh, India and they took uh, a ship from Bombay to, um, to Kenya, to Nairobi. Yeah. And to Nairobi, um, they, um, they, they lived there in Nairobi uh, for about 10 years. Mm. And so then when my dad was like 20, he moved, he went back to the village got married to my mother, and then he took a plane mm. and went to England okay. and spent two years there, and then my mother joined him um, okay. in 1962. Okay. Yeah. So it would take another 20 years or something before you'd migrate to yes. Canada? Yeah, we spent okay. about 20 years. Do you, Have you been back to India? Uh, yes. Um, I went uh, many years ago. Um, I went uh, to... The first time I went to India was, I went to the south of India, I went to, um, uh, to places like Mysore, Bangalore, mm. um, Goa, and then Bombay, and then up to Delhi. Um, then after that, in to 1999, I went to Calcutta, because the Calcutta has the book fair there, yeah. and so I was invited to read for my work at the Calcutta book fair, and then I took a long train journey to Delhi. And then oh, I went to Rajasthan, God. and then I stayed in Udaipur. I stayed there for uh, about a week, came back to Delhi, and then I came back to Canada. Okay. So I have had the experience of being in India. The difficulty is, I'm not Indian. I mm. am 
definitely a product of my fragmented life. And so even though I, I was really happy to be there, I knew that everybody knew I was not from India. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah. I wonder how. <laughs> Everything, body language and how you speak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what were your impressions, basically, when you went back the most recent trip? What do you remember of that? Um, I remember Calcutta being just an absolutely amazing, truly inspiring city. And it's, it's also a city of vast contrasts where the poverty is so real and the, the, um, and the people who have, have good lives there have really good lives there. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, my impressions were that India at that time was a country that was on the brink of becoming more of an international country and becoming more mm -hmm. uh, cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. But also there's this whole... Um, tension with capitalism, right, and opening up the economy. And, um, and so my impression was that it's still also very much old India, right? Things get done in a certain way. Mm. And um, I'm not sure how it is in Pakistan, but in India, it's, it's how you kind of negotiate and navigate people and their authority. And, you know, they're always looking for bakshish and all of those things. It's exactly the same. Yeah, and uh, so, but, uh, you know, taking the train journeys, it was wonderful. Um, I met so many people who were inter really interested in knowing me, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm knowing them, mm -hmm. and having those conversations while these, these big, long train rides across the country, it was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Indira, I wanted to do this interview for a long time, and uh, thank you for the opportunity, and that the fact that it's you know, in your workspace, yeah. And you've let me in here, and uh, I hope the viewers will enjoy what you had to say and what you had to share. Well, I hope so, and thank you. Thank you, thank you very, very much. It was an honor for me. Thank you.